guess.
All right, hello and welcome to the Virtual Sky Tour. Welcome to A Thousand Shimmering Lights. I am your host, David Watley, and I am the membership director for the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society, which you can see I've put up an image here. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a quick moment to uh, shout out the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society and make sure I'm doing my job as membership director. Uh, so if you are watching this stream and you are interested in the subject of astronomy and you want to learn more about how you can become a member of our club, uh, first of all, you can always email me. My email address is membership at nefas.org, just like you see there in that picture with Saturn. Uh, our website is nefas.org, and as you see here, we do have this membership tab right here. And you can hit Join Nephis. You can learn more about joining the club there. Fill that out, PayPal. And here are our membership levels. And you are good to go. You'll get a nice welcome email from me. Uh, we have monthly meetings. We've just started meeting in person again, and we're going to also start to do public outreach in person hopefully soon um even when that begins though i do intend to continue doing these live streams every month uh the other club i want to quickly shout out i'm a member of this club as well uh if you don't live in the greater jacksonville area if you do live in the saint augustine area or if you just want to be a member of both clubs um there is the ancient city astronomy club which is in St. Augustine, there are another great group of guys who are passionate about astronomy. Uh, I'm going to take a quick second and put both of those web addresses into both chats, uh, both the, um, the YouTube chat and the Twitch chat. You just give me one second here. So first, this is the St. Augustine Club. This is Ancient City Astronomy Club website there and then let me get the one for nephis as well copy that and put that here and in the twitch as well cool uh this is my first time doing this simultaneously to youtube and twitch uh currently we have six viewers on youtube and just me on twitch so it looks like YouTube seems to be the way to go, which is cool because that means if you have a Google account, you can participate. You can hop on the chat, ask questions. Uh, as always, this show is driven by you guys, the viewers. So I want you guys to be asking your questions in the chat, getting involved in the conversation. We There's, ne there's never any prepared, uh, pre-planned uh, agenda for what we're going to talk about. I just like to talk about space. Um, I can start just talking about stuff. Uh, <laughs> Jane says it'll be nice to see the starry skies on this cloudy evening. Yeah, weather's not been great in Florida lately. Um, it is how, it is how it is. So, like I said, I do plan on doing these every month. This is uh, viewer driven as well. So as I'm talking, if there's anything that occurs to you, anything you're interested in, it could be about planets, the formation of stars, the mythology behind the constellations, literally anything that you're curious about. Just throw that right in the chat. Um, I actually do have both chats here, by the way. I've got the YouTube and Twitch chat. Um, but currently, everyone's on YouTube, so I'm just going to keep that YouTube chat up for now. Um, and yeah, tell your friends. Tell everybody um, this stream is going to be going on for two hours tonight. You don't have to sit and watch the entire stream because there's no prepared lecture. It's not like you're going to miss it or be late for something. Um, so post this to your Facebook walls. Let everybody know. I want to blow this thing right up. And I want this to be a place where people who are familiar with astronomy and have a long history with astronomy and people who are brand new, whose knowledge base is not, you know, this vast thing or whatever, but they're just curious. They just want to know more about the universe. This is for everybody. And this is for people to come and ask your questions and learn more about space. So in that regard, I'm just going to go ahead and kick things off. Um, and I'm going to do it my usual way. I'm just going to give a quick a uh, little tour of tonight's sky, talk about what's up right now if we didn't have these clouds, what you could see. And then as inspiration strikes or people start asking questions in the uh, in the chat there, we'll just go from there and that'll be tonight's show. So let me just remove this real fast and we'll get right into it. So first of all, I want to quickly say that the software I use, this is called Stellarium. 
Um, there is actually, it's completely free. Um, you can actually download it to your computer. There's also this web-based client. Now, I actually like the downloaded version a little better, but we found that the web-based client works better on the stream. Not sure why that is, but for whatever reason, um, when I'm moving things around, the standalone client doesn't update in real time, whereas the web-based one seems to do so, and it just works better for the stream. So this is our sky at, let's see here, this is uh, about 940. So this would be, let's see if we can set it to real time. So this would be real time, right? And yeah, this is this is about 930 right here. 935 is where we're looking. One of the cool things about using software is that we don't have to just be limited to what's in the sky right now. We can time travel and jump about. Um, but let's take a quick uh, second to just familiarize ourselves with what's in the sky. Um, a good trick to do whenever you're out looking at things, especially if you're new and you're learning the constellations and you're starting to get into stargazing, is to learn a couple of bright, easy to find constellations. And then when you go out on any given evening, orient yourself by finding those. And then you can continue from there and you can start to find other things. So for the winter sky, and we're, we're starting to lose this constellation as we're moving on into summer, but in the, the winter sky up, up until about you know early mid spring, a really good one to go for, it's probably one of the easiest constellations to spot, is Orion. And over here we can already see its outline. If I add in the lines, there we go. So Orion is a really good winter constellation. Now you'll see this is the western horizon here. So as you, if I time travel forward, Orion's not going to be up for very long tonight. We're starting to lose Orion as we're moving away from the winter months and into the summer months. But uh, nonetheless, it's a great place to start. The easiest way to recognize Orion, the belt is unmistakable. This chain of stars and then this hourglass shape, right? So you'll notice in this software that I use, Stellarium, which again is free, uh, the, and this is, this is also true of most star charts, that the brightness of the stars is represented symbolically by the size of the dot, right? So you can see that the bigger dots represent brighter stars, and you see that Orion is made up of very bright stars. So even in very light polluted skies, Orion is something that you can find, assuming their sky is clear and it's the right time of the year. Uh, and the easiest way, like I said, is to find this hourglass shape with the three stars that form the belt. And you'll usually see this guy, Sigma Orionis, just below the belt. It's also usually visible. So you'll, often you'll see the belt and a star below it, right? Now, as I said, Orion's a winter constellation. We're starting to lose it now. But Orion forms part of something we call the winter hexagon. I'm going to time travel back a few months here. Just to, eh, one month actually looks like it's good. Just to bring it up a little higher in the sky. So this is how it would have looked a month ago in March. So Orion is part of a group of very bright constellations that are easy to find in the wintertime. Uh, this is one of the reasons I really enjoy winter stargazing. There's a lot of really good uh, bright winter constellations we can look at. And there's a pattern in the sky, what we call an asterism. So an asterism is a pattern of stars that is not an official constellation. Sometimes they include multiple constellations or it's a part of a constellation. Orion's belt is an asterism. That's a familiar shape in Orion. Well, there's an asterism in this part of the sky that we call the winter hexagon. And it basically is a hexagonal shape of bright stars. It helps us identify six constellations easily. So if you get out on a winter sky and you find Orion, the brightest star in Orion here is Rigel, or it's one of the brightest stars. And the winter hexagon connects Rigel to Sirius, to Procyon, to Castor and Pollux, to Capella, Aldebaran, back to Rigel. That's the winter hexagon. So that's a loop of particularly bright stars that's easy to find in the winter. And the cool thing is if you can find the winter hexagon, you have found six different constellations. Uh, Orion is the easiest to find. But the brightest star in the winter hexagon is Sirius. And an interesting thing about Sirius is that it's not just the brightest winter hexagon star. 
it's not just the brightest star in the winter sky. It is the brightest star in the sky, period. It's the brightest star other than the sun, obviously, which is the day star. But in the nighttime sky, Sirius is the brightest star there is. You won't actually find anything brighter than Sirius. If you find something as brighter than Sirius, it's not a star. right? It's, it's a planet or something else. Now, a common bit of confusion, I'm just going to pause on this topic real fast, because people are often surprised to hear that, that Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. So a lot of people think that the brightest star is the North Star, also called Polaris. But actually, if we go over and we find the North Star real fast, you'll see that the dot's pretty big. It's not a dim star, right? But it's nowhere near as bright as Sirius. In fact, we measure the brightness of stars on a scale called magnitude, where the lower the number, the brighter the star. Kind of like with, you know, gauges, like earring gauges, the lower the number, the bigger the gauge, or, you know, needle gauges or whatever stars work the same way. The smaller the number, the brighter the star. And, of course, all the brightest stars are going to be magnitude 1. And Polaris isn't even magnitude 1. It's actually magnitude 2.09. So if we compare that uh, to Sirius, Sirius is a negative 1 magnitude. It actually is, is too bright for the magnitude scale. It's a negative 1. So uh, Polaris is actually the 43rd brightest, I want to say. 43rd brightest star in the sky. Uh, once we find Sirius, though, we've found Canis Major. So even if I remove the lines, I like to remove the lines because this is how we're going to actually see it in the sky. Now, one thing I'm not a big fan of with the uh, web-based version of Stellarium is, there we go, delete the atmosphere, is that I can't adjust for light pollution. So you're probably not going to see this many stars, right? I, I want to tone it down so that it looks more like what you might see from the city, but... Sirius is easy to find. You can usually find Wezen and Adara pretty easily. This bit right here, Eludra, forms the tail. Got the hind legs. Mirzam is like the where the front legs are. Right, it's the body of the of the dog. And then this little triangle up here with stars that don't even all have names. Uh, this is the head of the dog, right? So that's Canis Major. That's the big dog. Another constellation we can find with the next bright star in the winter hexagon, Procyon, and we find this star right here, Gomesa. These two stars are all there is to Canis Minor. That's the little dog. Uh, now, I gave a sky tour in person one time, and I always would crack a joke, and I would say, looks just like a dog, doesn't it? And get a lot of laughs. And this little girl, she had to have been no more than like five years old. Uh, she said, it's a hot dog. So... From now on, in my mind, uh, this constellation Canis Minor is a hot dog. So I think it looks a lot more like a hot dog. If we follow this up further, we find these two bright stars here, Castor and Pollux. They are like twins, and that's appropriate because we have just found the Gemini twins. If we add in the lines, you can see we can kind of play connect the dots and get two stick figures for the Gemini twins. If we move over from Castor and Pollux, we find Capella. And Capella is the brightest star in a constellation called Auriga the Charioteer. If we delete the lines, you can still easily find this loop of bright stars here. And that is Capella. Now, Capella is a charioteer. Capella is also, or not Capella, sorry. Auriga is a charioteer. Um, Auriga is also said to be holding a goat in his arms. And so Capella is sometimes called the kid star. Or I've also heard sometimes these three stars referred to as the kids, meaning the baby goats, right? Because he's got the goats tucked under his arm like he's carrying them home. Maybe they got lost. From Capella, we keep going. We find this other bright star here called Aldebaran. And then we find this V shape. So we connect Aldebaran to this guy down here, up here, up here, right? This sort of V shape. Now this V shape... Uh, is actually an open star cluster. And we can talk in a little bit about what an open star cluster is, and you'll find lots of them in the winter sky. Again, I'm, I'm checking these chats routinely, so if you have any questions or any topics you're interested in, don't feel like you're going to interrupt me. Just dump them right in the chat. I'll get to them. Uh, again, I want this to be an audience-led show. I want you guys to be driving this thing. Um, but if you find this V-shape, it's an open star cluster we call the Hyades. And the Hyades forms the face of Taurus the Bull. If we extend this V, 
we find this star right here, Zeta Tauri, and we find Almath. If I add in the lines, it's a little clearer. These are the tips of the horns of Taurus the bull, right? We got the face, we got the horns. When we come down, his feet are down here someplace. And the Pleiades are the butt of the bull. And the Pleiades is another open star cluster. If we zoom in, you see there's actually a lot of stars going on here, right? Naked eye, it usually just looks like a little tiny shopping cart. Now, this is one of those funny things, and I love to get audience interaction when I do these things live. And I always like to ask people, can you find a constellation? Or sometimes if I'm just hanging out with a person, I'll say, you know, hey, is, can you find a constellation? Is there a constellation that you know? And I've had people point this one out, and they say, is that the Little Dipper? Right? That's a good guess, because it is sort of shaped like what you've probably seen for the Dippers. It would be like the Microscopic Dipper. Um, the Little Dipper is actually about the size of Canis Major. Uh, the Pleiades is much, much smaller. But what it actually is is really cool. It's a star cluster. And one fun fact about the Pleiades is that it is actually... Um, oh, got a little satellite here. What's it, what is this guy? One of the Starlink guys. Cool, cool. You sometimes see them at night. Uh, so one of the interesting things about the Pleiades is that that's the Greek name, right? And it's named after uh, the daughters of Atlas, from Greek mythology, but in Japan, they call the Pleiades Subaru, right? Subaru is actually the name of the Pleiades. And in fact, the Subaru car company is named after the Pleiades, right? I'm going to try and find a picture of the Subaru logo because the old Subaru logo was even shaped like the Pleiades before they, they redesigned it. Yeah, here's actually, uh, trust Wikipedia to always find good stuff. Here's a picture on Wikipedia that compares the original Subaru logo to the Pleiades Star Cluster. So uh, that's just a fun fact for you if you didn't know that the Subaru car company is actually named after an astronomical uh, object. So, and I want to say that in Japanese, Subaru means cluster or it means to come together. Something like that. It's because several car companies merge to form the main company, and so that's where the name comes from. So that's 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 a, a quick tour of the Winter Hexagon. So just to recap, we've learned how to find Orion, Canis Major, the big dog, Canis Minor, the little dog, Gemini, the twins, or we would say Canis Minor is, Minor is the hot dog, right? <laughs> the Gemini twins, Ariga, the charioteer, and Taurus the Bull. A couple other constellations we can find while we're here. Lepus. If I turn off the, the lines, I've always felt that Lepus is sort of vaguely butterfly or bow tie shaped. Because you find these guys, right? And you come down like this and you get this sort of bow tie shape under Orion. And what it actually is, is it's supposed to represent a hair. If I add in the artwork, you can kind of see it's the bunny rabbit there. Now, Orion is a hunter, right? And he has his hunting dogs, which is Canis Major and Canis Minor. And so Lepus uh, is what he's hunting. And the thing that I find entertaining about it, I've always imagined Lepus aimed the other direction, by the way. This artwork shows him going this way with these stars being his ears. I've always imagined these stars out here being his ears. And I've always liked to think that he's getting the better of Orion. Like Orion's over here looking for... Lepus, his hogs are, his, his hounds are running around and the rabbit's getting away. Right? I like to imagine that the, uh, the rabbit's getting away in this case. Maybe not. Maybe Orion's going to get him one day. We'll just have to have to see. Uh, another constellation over here is Monoceros. But one thing I want to point out is as how tiny these dots are. Uh, even from really dark skies. Monoceros is a difficult constellation to find. In fact, it's almost harder to find when you get out somewhere really dark because it just blends right into the Milky Way. It just blends right into the background there, and it just becomes very difficult to find. So, looks like we have 12 people watching the stream. Excellent. As I said before, if you're watching the stream, um, don't be afraid to comment with any kind of comments, questions, whatever i want to see that chat start blowing up and you guys talking about space and that gives me ideas because otherwise i'm gonna have to make up what i'm going to talk about for the next hour and a half but uh hopefully we'll start to get some activity in the in the comments there and that'll start to drive some of this conversation because um, again i really want this 
thing to be your show, not just my show. It's not my place to feed my ego and just talk. I want you guys to ask the things that you want to know, right? Uh, to feed your curiosity. One thing I can touch on real fast, because this is a month ago. If we go back to tonight, here we go. Uh, Mars is up in the tips of Taurus the bull. So if it weren't cloudy tonight, if we had a clear night, ooh, this is actually kind of a cool alignment here. We've got the moon and Mars right there. That's kind of nice. Uh, but yeah, Mars is up. Mars um, is an easy object to spot through a telescope. Um, it it varies a lot though, depending on where it what where it is in its orbit. In fact, last year we had a really close conjunction with Mars, or a close opposition with Mars, where it was very big, and you could easily see not just you know this orange dot in your telescope, but you could even make out some of the details in the surface. You actually see light and dark patches in the surface of Mars, and make out surface details. It was really cool. It was actually really really cool. Uh, so that's some of the cool things about this part of the winter sky. One thing the winter is really good about, and I mentioned this earlier, is open star clusters. So in the absence of any uh, questions in the chat, how the Mars and the moon are in, in near occulta occultation. So I guess I read your mind, because I was starting to talk a little bit about the conjunction of Mars and the moon. We can talk a little bit more about that. So uh, let's see what happens if we do a little bit of time travel tonight. We're just going to go up hour by hour and they're going to set. Okay. Yeah. So we're not going to get an occultation tonight. I wonder if we start to click ahead. Oop, where did the moon go? <laughs> okay. We click ahead one day. I wonder if the moon disappeared on us. Probably below the horizon. Let me see if I can get it back. Uh, there's the sun. Yeah, so it looks like... Well, let's go back to tonight. So they are nice and close tonight. Like I was saying, it's a nice little uh, close conjunction. Um, there is a difference between a conjunction and an occultation. An occultation is basically like an eclipse. An eclipse is a kind of occultation. It's when one thing blocks your view of something else, right? Uh, oftentimes, it's the moon. The moon occults objects. And so if we zoom in... There's pretty much always some occultation going on, right? So if we if we get really close here and look at the moon, so this star right here is about to get occulted by the moon, right? It's a bright side occultation, so it's going to disappear on the bright side. Um, but sometimes the moon blocks a planet or a particularly bright star, and those are always really cool to watch. Um, we did have last year a really close conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, where you could see them in the telescope at the same time. And that was really cool. Uh, let's see here. I guess there's not much else to really say. Hey, Emily's in the chat. Welcome, Emily. Uh, Emily's a member of our astronomy club, and she's uh, she's fantastic. She, she does a lot of really cool observations, is really excited about astronomy. She's got a very infectious excitement for the hobby. Uh, so what I was saying is I think that's about everything I can really say about the occultation of, of Mars. I'm going to check the Twitch and just see if anyone's over there. Okay, it looks like Emily's in both places. But other than that, everyone seems to be over here in the uh, in the YouTube chat. Astro surfacing. The moon passed close to Mars earlier today. Probably had to be way east like Europe or Asia. Yeah, so let's see... If we can change our location in Stellarium. Not sure how to do it in the web-based version. Maybe it's up here in Observe. Oh, here we go. Near Jacksonville. So let's see if we change our location. We'll just drop us in the middle of China real fast. There we go. Okay. Nope, I don't think it like that. Okay. There we go. I was going to say Beijing. Use this location. 
There we go. So now we're going to have to adjust the time so that we are. Let's see. Eh. Yeah, I'm not sure if we can get an occultation. I'm going to go back to Jacksonville. Jacksonville, Florida. Use this location. Cool. All right. Uh, oh, boy. And then... Oh, because I, I went past midnight. All right. So, here's something we can actually get into a little bit. Because summertime is coming up. We can uh, we can talk a little bit about the summer constellations. So why don't we talk about that a little bit? So we talked a bit about the winter constellations. I'm going to time travel a little bit just to get us deep into the summertime. There we go. And let's talk a little bit about summer. So... Uh, here we go. Yep. All right. One of the cool sights of the summertime is Sagittarius and Scorpius, right? So this is a this is another Sagittarius is another really easy to spot constellation and a great one to look for. And it's most easily identifiable because these bright stars here, these are all particularly bright large dots. They form a sort of teapot, right? And it looks just like a teapot. I got the spout over here. All right, got the lid of the teapot up there and the handle. All right now, this is actually the teapot is an asterism. As you can see, there are more stars that are linked up here by the lines. If I add the artwork as well, it's supposed to be a centaur wielding a bow and arrow. Um, but for me, I, all I can ever see is the teapot. It, it is definitely a teapot to me. Now. Uh, once we find Sagittarius, Scorpius isn't too difficult to find either. We can usually find these three bright stars, including Antares, and these three guys right here, Acrab, Deshuba, and Pi Scorpio. I guess it doesn't have a cool name for that one. This, These three right here picture a line across the shoulders, and then this is picture like the abdomen or the thorax, I guess you would call it of the scorpion. So the this body of the scorpion is here. And then if we follow this curve, we hit all these stars in a big chain that comes around and up like this and then it makes a very sharp bend, right? And Oh, is there an object here? I meant to click this sc this star. I guess there's something right next to that star. So this star right here, G Scorpii is the tip of the stinger, right? So this is the, the tail and the stinger of the scorpion. So add the scorpion, kind of obvious, right? So these are summertime constellations. These are things we can expect to see in the summertime. One of the cool things about Sagittarius, though, is if you find Sagittarius and you look at the tip of the teapot, just about outside the tip of the teapot, right about here-ish, is actually the core of the Milky Way galaxy. If you look that direction, you're looking right at the galactic core. And this actually leads me to something interesting I can talk about, which is the difference between the summer Milky Way and the winter Milky Way. Now, one of the Facebook groups, and I hope you guys can hear me okay. Let me make sure my mic is positioned well. Uh, one of the Facebook groups I posted to is the Stargazers group, right? So uh, if you're interested in stargazing and getting out and just looking naked eye, or if you're you know, a member of one of the other many groups I posted this to and you just really like space, a really cool thing you can look for if you get out in a nice dark location is to look for the Milky Way. And so you'll see this bright, it won't look quite like you're seeing here in the software. You'd have to take an exposure with a camera to get something like this, but you'll see this bright streak across the sky and that's the Milky Way. Now, in reality, what you're seeing is you're actually seeing the Milky Way galaxy. Now, I'm not gonna bring up a picture of the Milky Way. We're inside of it. But I'm going to bring up a Milky Way look-alike. So. This right here is Messier 83. So Messier 83 is also called the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. And it is, a, it is often considered to be a galaxy that looks fairly much like what we would expect the Milky Way would look like from the outside. 
So, as you can see, it's a big swirling spiral of stars, but it, if we viewed it from the edge on, it would look more like... Let me think of what's a good edge on galaxy. I'll do some... Let me... You know what? I'll just do everyone's favorite, Andromeda Galaxy. All right. So, this is what the Milky Way would look like somewhat tilted, right? So, you can see it's a disk shape. And... So when we look through this disk from within, it appears linear, right? It appears as a streak across the sky. But if I go back to M83 real fast, I do want to touch on why we have differences in what we see in the wintertime versus what we see in the summertime in terms of the Milky Way, in terms of the constellations and these kinds of things. So if we look at this picture... Uh, when, we, when we pretend that this is the Milky Way galaxy we're looking at, we see we got these big spiral arms, which are rich in stars and star-forming material. All the pink, by the way, that you're seeing in this image, those are uh, hydrogen clouds with new star formation in them. So when you look at these images of galaxies, when you see them lit up pink like that, th those are newly formed stars. So M83 is very active right now in star formation. But... The Milky Way is moderately active, not quite as active as this, I don't think. But anyway, the star, the, the spiral arms, rich in that kind of thing. And then we have these gaps in between the arms. Now, the core in the middle is incredibly dense with stars, and we actually don't live in the core. What we, Where we live is sort of between two spiral arms. So, um, again, I'm using M83 as a stand-in, so it's not a perfect representation, but... If you see how this spiral arm is right here, I hope you guys can see my magnifying glass mouse pointer right here. You see this, this spiral arm is sort of like um, the Perseus arm of our own galaxy, and then we have like the Sagittarius arm, and then there's a little, little like offshoot. So like right here almost, you can see how there's this little offshoot. Like the arm continues this way, but there's like a little offshoot here, what we would call a spur. Uh, so in the Milky Way galaxy, we have what's called the Orion Spur of the Perseus arm of the Milky Way. They're named after constellations that are in that direction, obviously. We live in the Orion Spur. So if we can just imagine this little dot you see right here. I'm going to zoom in. Can I zoom in a little bit? Yeah. So here we've got our little... Spur, And I'm just going to grab a random star in here to act as a stand-in for the sun because, um, obviously, again, this is not the real Milky Way galaxy. But let's just say this little dot right here is the sun, right? That's kind of like how we live in the Milky Way. So the thing to remember is that we orbit the sun like this, right? As I'm drawing my little lollipop around this star, that represents the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now... We obviously can't look at anything on the other side of the sun, right? So our ability to see things at night is what... That's us pointed away from the sun, right? So anything we see at night is the direction away from the sun. But as we orbit the sun, if we imagine drawing out a wedge to represent our view at night, that wedge moves as we orbit. And so we sweep out the whole Milky Way in the course of a single year. It just so happens to be that for the northern hemisphere of the Earth, when it's winter time, we're over here. We're on this side of the sun, looking at the Orion Spur and the Perseus arm and looking out past the edge of the galaxy. I'm going to zoom out a little bit to make that a little clearer. There we go. So when we're over on this side of the sun, we're seeing this stuff over here. And in the summertime, we come around and we look across the gap at Sagittarius and Scorpius, and we look through the core, and we see all of this. And for that reason, the summertime Milky Way is much brighter and bigger in the sky, because we're looking through everything, and we're looking at the core. And in fact, if you were to see the galaxy completely edge on, you would see that it bulges in the middle. We actually get this bulge in the middle, kind of like a flying saucer, like you would imagine. Uh, there's like a hub, right, to the Milky Way. And if we look in the sky, we actually can see that, right? We see the Milky Way gets brighter, but if you look, it gets wider. Look how wide it is over here by Sagittarius. That is actually the galactic bulge that you're seeing, right? 
So if we go back to the winter time, if we go back to like February, let's say, we see how dim and thin the Milky Way is. And right around Perseus, this is Perseus right here, it pretty much fades away entirely, right? So if you really like the Milky Way and you want to get out and have your mind blown by the Milky Way, the summer is the best time to get out and view the Milky Way. Now here in Florida, that presents a challenge because the summer is also the worst time to go out and observe because of clouds. But if you can find a clear, a clear moonless night, so we, we're looking at last quarter moon or new moon, and you can find a place nice and dark, and you can observe that summer Milky Way. If you do actually get involved with uh, our club or the St. Augustine Club, we both have uh, great observing locations that are very dark and very remote where you can see that, where you can observe the Milky Way. And I think it's worth observing the summer Milky Way for its beauty and grandeur. I think it's worth observing the, the winter Milky Way to see the difference and to really get this idea that you that these aren't just abstract concepts, that these are real places. There's a real place where we live and we get a different vantage point on our home throughout the year, right? So one of the cool things about the summertime is it's great for observing our own galaxy. Now, one thing I'll point out about the summertime, we're going to go back to the summer. Right, we're going to go there and we're going to find the Milky Way. Do, 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 do. There it is, right? So another really interesting thing is that you might have heard that there's a supermassive black hole in the heart of the Milky Way galaxy. That is true. It's called Sagittarius A star. And it lives about here as well, deep in the core. Um, now, one cool thing about the summertime as well is it's a really good time to view a certain kind of object called a globular cluster. Um, because they tend to be concentrated around the galactic core. So um, that's what all these little circles with the plus sign in them are. These are indicating globular clusters. Uh, I'm going to zoom in on one. Let's we'll zoom in on M4. M4 doesn't get nearly enough love. It's over here near Antares in, um, in Scorpius. And as you can see, it is just a tightly packed ball of stars, right? Um, I've just realized that I've left my image of, of M83... Uh, open there, but actually we'll go back to it real fast because I am going to bring up a globular cluster. Actually, I'm going to bring up M13. M13 is a really nice globular cluster. Maybe if I get rid of the, the space, just do M13. Oh, here we go. Messier 13. There it was. This guy right here, right? A globular cluster is a tightly packed ball of, of stars. Just, yeah, somebody just let me know. I saw the overlay up. Yeah, sorry. I forgot about that. Uh, sorry, but I'll go back to, to show it to you guys again in Stellarium. Um, but I just want to quickly show, which is talking about globular clusters, it's just a really packed cluster of stars. Um, they, they look like little fuzzy balls through the telescope. But yeah, let me get back to... Let me turn off the visual aid here. There we go. And I'll go back to Stellarium real fast and show what I was talking about. So this is what I was talking about in Stellarium, where you see this wide bulge, right? And we see that the summer Milky Way is big and bright. And then the, the winter Milky Way fades out. So, and, oh, hey, Andrew. Andrew and Angie are here. Excellent. Uh, glad you guys are participating in the chat now. So, again, if anybody has any questions about anything, feel free to throw those in the chat. If not, I'm just going to keep talking about whatever comes to my mind. Um, one thing you'll notice as we look at the Milky Way, and you really can see this. If you get somewhere dark enough, you can see this naked eye. Is this these dark regions, right? These areas where it almost looks like there's holes in the Milky Way, right? Where it looks like you see this bright glowing streak across the sky and then you'll find these areas of low brightness. And these are actually what are called dust clouds or dust lanes. And what they really are is they're collections of gas and dust, interstellar gas and dust, and they're blocking the starlight behind them, right? 
if I bring up, if we, if we go back to Google, bring up my Google images real fast. Oop, got rid of Stellarium entirely. There we go. I think the Andromeda Galaxy is a really good view. And you see them here in this picture, right? So I think from this angle, it's a little clearer what you're actually seeing, which is these big clouds, and they're getting in the way of the light that's behind them, right? That's what's going on in our own Milky Way. And so when you look up, And you see these sort of dark regions here in the sky. Uh, now, one of the questions that I just now saw in the chat, uh, why do the planets get so much larger past the asteroid belt? And can we talk a little bit about neutron stars? Awesome. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and take both of those suggestions because the, the first answer is really short, and it's we don't know, actually. There is not a current model that explains why the planets past the asteroid belt are so much larger than the planets within the asteroid belt. For some reason, our solar system seems to be organized in this sort of way where close to the sun, we have small rocky planets and then there's a belt of asteroid material, right? And then beyond that, we get these enormous gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. Actually, the very next planet is the biggest one. That's Jupiter. And then they get a little bit smaller after that. It's not entirely clear why this is the case. And there is a hypothesis that it could have been the way that the initial protoplanetary nebula, the big swirling cloud of gas and dust around the, the newborn sun, cooled. And that um, if you imagine that it would have been hotter closer to the sun and cooler further away, um, and you think of the melting point, how hot you have to get it to melt rocks, and vaporize rocks versus how hot it has to be to vaporize like hydrogen. And so the thought was, well, maybe all the big gas giants form further away from the sun where it's colder and that rocky bodies form closer to the sun where they're the only things that can form when it's that hot. Right. Uh, Susie says maybe all the rocky planets had an original source, right? There was some source of rocks closer to the sun. Uh, the problem with this model is that when we look at other stars with things like the Kepler mission, where they, they try to find planets orbiting other stars, we find that it doesn't hold true of a lot of other stars, that there are what are called hot Jupiters, that there are many stars out there that have these massive gas giants orbiting right up next to them. And so this organization of small rocky planets close to the star, big gas giants far from the star, doesn't seem to be universally true. And so the the reasoning for it, why our solar system is organized this way, it's still up for debate. It's actually still an active area of research that we're still trying to figure out why that would be the case. Um, now, one interesting thing before I move on to the neutron star topic, because I do want to talk a bit about neutron stars because they are awesome. But... Uh, Another interesting topic when it comes to rocky bodies is that our solar system is not finished f forming, right? Um, the, the process, I'll actually talk a little bit about planet formation, right? And we'll talk about a protoplanetary nebula. Let me see if I can get a good image of one on Google. Or also called a pr protoplanetary disk, right? And mostly we have like artists interpretations of these things because they're hard to visually observe but an artist's interpretation is fine for our purposes so this is what we'd expect to see in the early life of our sun so the sun formed out of mostly hydrogen and a big gas cloud the stuff that wasn't mostly hydrogen sort of all gets swirled around this newly forming star and then as this stuff clumps up we get planets right um, there are meteor showers and comets and asteroids and meteors that come through the atmosphere all the time because this process is still ongoing. The solar system hasn't neatly organized itself into planets. There's still a bunch of stuff out there that still hits planets and adds to their material on a daily basis. Um, this process is called accretion the, 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 is the term for when a body accretes matter, it gains matter from around it, right? as material is pulled in and added to the surface. We call that accretion. 
So another term for this is an accretion disk. And the accretion of material is still ongoing uh, in our own solar system for many of the planets. We, we think of this as like a then the planets formed and now whatever, but really it's an active ongoing process. Uh, that's why the moon is so scarred. Things hit the moon all the time. Uh, the dinosaurs learned the hard way, right, that this process is ongoing. But, yeah, it's, it's a really good question why our solar system seems to have this very clear-cut organization, and it's not entirely clear why that's the case. Um, so somebody asked about neutron stars. So let's talk a little bit about neutron stars. So neutron stars are the leftover remnants of dead stars, right? And so to talk about neutron stars, I'm going to just talk about stellar evolution generally. I'm going to broaden the topic a little bit. And I'm going to go back to winter time because winter time actually has some really good examples of stellar lifetime that we can look at. So if we find our good friend Orion over here, if we zoom in a little bit on the sword, right? I'm actually going to go ahead, like I said, I'm going to broaden the topic. I'm going to tell the story from beginning to end because I think it's a really cool way to learn about it. So if we look here below the belt stars, we have these three stars here, here, and here. But if we zoom in, there's actually way more stars, and we find this big cloud of gas. Um, Stellarium's image of it, not great. So I'm going to bring it up in... Uh, Wikipedia real fast, always our go-to, Orion Nebula. So you remember I mentioned earlier that all that pink stuff you were seeing in that image of M83, that's where stars are being born. Well, this is what you're seeing when you see all that pink stuff in, a, in an image of a galaxy. So what this is, this is a big cloud of gas. And this cloud of gas is mostly hydrogen, um, has trace amounts of a bunch of other stuff, which is why you're seeing a bunch of different colors in this image but um, mostly hydrogen, and stars are mostly hydrogen. And what happens is, actually, I'm going to find you another picture because this one I think is really good. They even call it the Pillars of Creation for a reason. This is a really good image to, to show what I'm about to talk about. So here's another one of these big clouds of gas in the Milky Way. Now, what, you, what you're seeing here with these sort of column shapes, some parts of this gas are more dense than other parts, right? And radiation pressure from starlight actually blows this gas away, and we get these columns that are left because what's happening is that as that solar radiation is pushing against this gas cloud, that there must be something thick and dense right here, and we're getting like the shadow of that, if you, got, if you can sort of imagine that. Right, like a really good uh, place to look, right, is right here. There's some thick clump right there, right? So what happens is usually these gas clouds are more or less gravitationally stable and all the material is sort of distributed. But if something interacts with it, we have a supernova that goes off and sends a shock wave or one galaxy hits another or whatever, and something presses on this gas, we get these clumps that will form. Now, matter attracts matter. So... All the material in this gas cloud, every single atom is tugging a little bit on the others. But that tugging is sort of randomly distributed, and so it just drifts around as a gas cloud. But once it's no longer random, and you get a more concentrated area that's a higher density, then it's exerting more of a pull on the material around it, and it can draw in additional material. There's that vocabulary word, accretion, again, right? We're going to accrete more material. And so this clump is going to grow and grow and pull more material in. And eventually that clump gets big enough and has accreted enough material that its own mass weighing on itself, crushing inward, is enough to heat it up to the point where nuclear fusion actually becomes possible. And, okay, so I wanted to go ahead and double check and make sure I wasn't ignoring anybody in the Twitch stream. So nuclear fusion becomes possible and this thing clicks on basically and becomes a star. And it's actually really cool when they do. They, they, they form something called a Herbig Harrow object or an HH object. Herbig Harrow object. So this right here, what you're seeing, these two streams, that's a baby star announcing its birth to the world. 
is basically what you're seeing. It's really cool. Um, because as this material collects, it also begins to rotate. That's just a natural consequence of this thing kind of coming in, coming together, and it just starts to spin and spin and spin. And the stars will spin up really fast. And once it heats up enough, nuclear fusion becomes possible. Hydrogen gets combined into helium, and you get light, you get heat, and you get a magnetic field. And so as the star is spinning, its magnetic field has a pole going up and going down. And so some of this material doesn't hit the surface of the star. It gets accelerated along those two poles. And so you're seeing that shooting out. And actually what's glowing here, this is not material being launched by the star. Actually, x-rays and things are being shot out. And it's just making the stuff that's already there glow, right? But this is a newly born star happening here. That's a hair big hero object, right? So stars announce their birth to the world oftentimes by doing this, and it's really cool. Um, if we go back, though, to the Orion Nebula, if we look in the heart of the Orion Nebula, we can actually find some baby stars. All right, so if I... Can I zoom in again? Ooh, hold up. Everything is just locking up on me now. There we go. Okay. And oh, there we go. Had a bit of lag. Oh, come on. We had it for a second. I'm just going to pull up a separate article on it. I think this image is just way too high res. And with me simultaneously streaming to two platforms, I think it's just more than more than our bandwidth can handle here. I hope my roommates aren't trying to download anything. They're probably like, what the heck, Dave? You're eating up all our bandwidth. Nope, this isn't what I meant. There we go, trapezium astronomy. Okay, so here's another picture of them, right? These are the trapezium stars. And they are at the heart of the Orion Nebula. Those are newborn baby stars. Now, once the star is formed, it's going to enter what's called its main sequence life. And this is where the star is just doing its thing. It's just converting hydrogen into helium, right? Turning hydrogen into helium, giving off heat and light. And through a star's life, it's basically constantly trying to implode and explode all the time, right? Because the gravity, the weight of the star wants to crush it inward. But the heat and energy of the nuclear fusion reaction going on in the core is trying to expand it, trying to explode it. And there's an equilibrium where these two things are balanced. And as long as the star has fuel, as long as there's hydrogen in the core, it can use that fuel to keep going with the fusion reaction and keep this stable. Now, the length of time that a star will be stable depends on its mass. In fact, the relationship is so well understood, it is such a basic relationship, it's just dependent on the laws of physics, that you can take the mass of a star, plug it into a formula, and you can predict exactly how long it's going to live. You can guess the life for any star. These stars you're seeing in the trapezium are 300,000 years old. They're actually pretty large. They're pretty big, big, hot stars. And so they're not going to last that long. They've got lifespans in around the tens of millions of years, um, which for stars is not a long time. Stars, um, it's actually an inverse relationship, by the way. The bigger the star, the more quickly it's going to consume all of its fuel and die, right? The smaller stars actually live much, much longer. And in fact, um, there are some stars these little red dwarfs, that their lives are literally measured in trillions of years. They'll outlast everything. Um, there are red dwarfs glowing today that formed at the dawn of time, and they're still going. It's, it's actually kind of incredible. Um, looks like we have a few people over on the Twitch stream. Uh, most of the people, looks like, are on the YouTube stream again, uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, I do have both chats, though. So if you're chatting in the Twitch chat, I will still see it. And I can show that as well. It just seems to be that the YouTube is the one. I might just cancel the Twitch altogether, depending on how this goes. Because it seems to be that YouTube is, is working out better for everybody. Um, so, yeah. So, that's the main sequence. Eventually, though, the star runs out of hydrogen in its core, right? Um, again, the little stars, it'll take longer for that to happen because they use their fuel more carefully. Picture like a big SUV versus a Prius, right? The SUV's got a bigger gas tank, but it's going to go through it quicker, right? 
And this is where I, I am finally going to get around to neutron stars. I know I took a really long way to get there. But this is where we get to neutron stars. Because when the star runs out of fuel, it begins to die. And what happens is this is actually where we get red giant stars. Right? So one of the things I'll often point out to people when I'm doing my in-person uh, astronomy sessions, outreach sessions, is I'll point out Betelgeuse. And I'll point out Aldebaran or Antares that we saw before in Scorpius. And I'll point these out because you can tell naked eye they're reddish looking or orangish is what they look like. But we would call that red in astronomy. And I ask people all the time, I'll say, do you know why they're red? And the answer is that they're dying. These are dying stars is what you're actually seeing. Because what happens is when the fuel runs out in the core, the collapsing force keep bumping my uh, pop filter here, the collapsing force wins out over the expanding force, at least temporarily. But a star is so huge, they don't just collapse all at once. The inside collapses and the outside has to catch up, right? They're so big, they can't collapse all at once. And so what happens is the core begins to collapse, but the energy of that collapse heats it up and actually allows for even higher level fusion, where we start, we stop doing the hydrogen to helium thing, which is what a star does for most of its life, and we can start making heavier and heavier elements. And then the energy of this reaction... Uh, oh, it looks like we have a comment going on here. Yeah, so Terry repeated what I was saying before, that, that hypothesis about the temperature gradient, that um, it's hotter near the sun, so it's harder to form gas giants near the sun. Uh, Terry, one thing I pointed out earlier, though, is that some of the data coming back from Kepler seems to disagree with that hypothesis. Because there are a lot of... Now, it may be that gas giants can form outside and move in, um, but it's not entirely clear, because when we look at the exoplanets, we don't always see that organization. But nonetheless, that hypothesis may still have merit, so... Yeah, but it is interesting. Uh, Terry mentions that same the temperature gradient hypothesis for planet formation. Uh, so what I was saying about the stars. So um, when you get that higher level fusion, that heat from that reaction will swell out the outer layers. But as they expand, they cool because that's the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. It'll cool as it expands. Uh, yeah, thank you for joining, Terry. Well, uh, welcome. Glad to have you here. Uh as those outer layers expand, they cool a bit and they turn redder. And that's where we get red giants. Now, the exact way that the star will end up dying depends on its mass. So we, we the question, the original question was about neutron stars. I haven't forgotten. I know I'm taking a really long way to get there. Um, so Betelgeuse, this, this guy right here is a good example. The really big stars, the really high mass ones are the ones that can form neutron stars. So what happens is that the core is now doing something even crazier than the hydrogen to helium reaction. We're getting things like carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, this kind of stuff. A star about the size of the sun, that's as far as it's going to get, right? But for these bigger guys, they start to repeat this process of running out of fuel, core collapse, it heats up, it now allows for a higher level of fusion, and it will heat a layer around it that will start fusing. And so you'll get these layers like an onion inside the star where you have hydrogen being converted to helium near the outer layers, and then you have the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. I keep mentioning those as a set because there's like a reaction that goes through all three. Um, further in, you start to get heavier, 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 and then eventually you'll get where the core is making iron, right? It's literally com converting heavier elements into iron. The problem is that iron is not like all the previous steps. Because for most of these, you, when the fusion reaction goes off, it gives off more energy than it takes to do that reaction, right? So you get something back. Iron is not like that. When the star makes iron, it takes more energy to make the iron than you get out of that fusion reaction. So it's a losing game. And so what happens is the core cannot sustain fusion any longer and all these layers start to collapse all at once. And what will happen is that this collapse happens rapidly. The star is so big and so heavy that the energy of the collapse, because this collapse is going to generate a lot of energy and we're going to start to get more fusion. We're actually going to get past iron 
like literally into like uranium and stuff by, before this happens. But it's all going to happen very quickly and none of it is going to be enough to prevent the collapse. Because at this point, this collapse occurs so quickly, the star is so heavy that it just smashes in and then it explodes. It just detonates from all the energy of all that fusion going off at once. And I can show you guys a picture of that. If we go back to my visual aids here. And here we go. That is the Crab Nebula. So look how shredded up it is. That is the exploded guts of a dead star, right? The big stars don't go out peacefully. They don't go gentle into that good night. They explode violently and they leave behind things like the Crab Nebula or another really good example is the Veil Nebula. Veil Nebula is a bit older than the Crab Nebula. It's further along. It's had more time to dissipate. But you're seeing here the leftover shredded rem remains of that exploded star. But that's what happens to the, those big guys. They explode. But what gets left behind is called a neutron star. And what this is, is there are certain laws of physics that say that there is a minimum amount that you can compress something, right? So there is a pressure exerted by subatomic particles like neutrons and protons that they don't want to be close together to a certain point, right? The nucleus of an atom has them all kind of packed in, but then you can't force them any smaller, right? Just the pressure these subatomic particles exert on each other says that you cannot compress that nucleus any smaller. That's as small as it gets. What basically happens with the neutron star is the entire star becomes an atomic nucleus. It all gets packed in. So you, if you look at me, right, I'm over 90% empty space. Right, because the nucleus of one atom and the nucleus of the other atom are separated. There's these little electrons floating about, and there's mostly nothing, right? There's mostly nothing in there. A neutron star, the entire star is solid. It's like, and I want to say that usually they're like the size of the Earth. They're not very big because they're just so smashed down. And the entire thing is basically one gigantic atomic nucleus. Um, all the protons absorb electrons and become neutrons, and you just get this tightly packed ball of neutrons. And when you have something that dense in the universe, it starts to just laugh at the laws of physics. It really does. It's some of the things you can quote about neutron stars. They're some of the most they are some of the most bizarre objects in the universe. They are they are incredible incredible objects because, for example. If you took a teaspoon of neutron star material and you just did like, let me get in front of the camera here. If you took a teaspoon and you did like this and you let it fall, first of all, that material would fly apart because it doesn't have the gravitational hold that a neutron star does. But if you would just imagine for a moment that it would remain consistent like a neutron star, just a teaspoon, if you did that, it would punch a hole clean through the earth because of how heavy and dense and massive it is. It would just punch a hole right through the earth, right? If you took a marshmallow, if you were in orbit of a neutron star and you just let the marshmallow go and its own weight pull it in, it would hit the surface with the force of a nuclear bomb from how much the neutron star would pull it in. It would smash into the surface with the force of a, of a nuclear bomb. Uh, I think it's something like a teaspoon of neutron star material weighs more than all the people on the Earth or something. It, it's insane how dense these objects are. And... By this point, they're spinning really quickly, too. They spin really, really fast, and they generate incredibly powerful magnetic fields. And what will happen is, that, like you said, they have the North Pole and the South Pole, and they're spinning, but they're also processing, like a top that's falling over. So like if you imagine you spin a top, and it spins about this axis, but then as it falls over, the axis wobbles like this. Neutron stars do that, but they're going so quick, they're like, toot, 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 like this. And they're shooting a beam of radio waves along that thing. And that spins again and again and again. And so if we point a radio telescope, what will often happen is we'll get like a click, 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 click. And that's a pulsar is what we call that. It just pulses repeatedly because it's just shooting out outrageous amounts of energy in the form of radio waves. And it points the radio wave at us every time it comes around. 
And also the neutron stars, I mean, obviously they're pointed all various directions. We only actually can perceive them as pulsars when they come around and they point at us. They don't all point at us, right? But that's, that's what you're getting with the neutron star. And they are, like I said, they are some of the most outrageous objects that exist in the universe. Um, one really cool thing about neutron stars is they're responsible for something called a, a nova. Not a supernova, but a nova. So if I pull up an example of this. By the way, while I'm doing my incredibly long-winded discussion of star birth and death, feel free to ask additional questions in the chat. I may not get to the question immediately, but it's a jumping off point for the next topic because I will still be here for another hour, basically. Um, and you'll give me something to talk about. Where was I? Yeah, okay. This, man, can we blow this up at all? All right, this is not the best image, but right here, sometimes you'll get a neutron star orbiting a red giant, <laughs> right? So you see the red giant here. This swirl, the neutron star is a speck inside of that swirl. And what'll happen is it'll accrete material from the um, from that bigger star from that red giant. It'll just suck material right off of it. Just steal it. That material builds up and builds up on the surface of the neutron star. And there gets to be a certain threshold at which the, the energy involved in just sitting on a neutron star, just sitting there, the pressures from the gravity are so immense that it heats up this layer of material that forms on the surface. And after it forms enough of this material, it just explodes. It just blows up. And so you'll get where it's basically like a supernova, but it repeats. It happens over and over again, and it doesn't destroy the neutron star. The neutron star is still there. And one thing that's really cool is that we can see them when this happens. They look like we get a new star in the sky. Um, sometimes you have to look through a telescope to see them. But if we move over, let's see, there's Arcturus. There's the Big Dipper, Little Dipper. Do, 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 do. Here it is. I'm going to have to time travel a little bit. There we go. So near Cassiopeia, right about in here-ish. Um, I don't still have my picker up, do I? Okay, cool. Um, there was a recently formed nova. There's a uh, nova that appeared. The bright star. It looked like a bright star, right? That appeared over in this area. And actually, if we zoom in, um, there is... This star cluster here, M52, and then there's these stars right here, and then you see this guy? There was a star next to it that's not normally there, right? And that was the Nova. Uh, there were a few of us in the club that were trying to get out and see it. I didn't get a chance to see it, and it's unfortunate because at this rate, you know, we're, we're kind of losing Cassiopeia. But at this rate, I'm probably not going to get an opportunity to see that Nova. But that's okay. There will be others. It happens. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a little bit about neutron stars. I'll be honest, I don't know a ton about them. Um, they're really fascinating, though. You could honestly very easily just burn away an afternoon uh, just looking at neutron star information, just reading all about them, learning all about them. Uh, looks like we have about eight people here in the stream. Uh, somebody in, I'm going to go ahead and, and I don't want to, I want to make sure I'm not ignoring my Twitch, my Twitch chat. So somebody in the Twitch chat says, does every depth of a star become a black hole? No, actually. Um, cause what we just talked about there is, is neutron stars, right? So some stars die and they become neutron stars. Um, but that is a good point that you bring up because if a star is big enough, like bigger than the stars that produce neutron stars, then yes, they will make black holes. Because they'll, they will collapse and become so dense that they'll actually overcome the laws of physics that say that they shouldn't be able to compress anymore. They'll just laugh in the face of that nonsense and keep going until they're literally compressed infinitely small. The, the black hole itself is a point, right? It's literally this big. But it's so hyper-dense that in a region of space around it, not even light can escape from getting sucked in and added to and we call that area the event horizon uh now i'm gonna flip the script a little bit because that's a great question about stars dying and do they all form black holes i'm gonna go the other direction and talk about smaller stars since i doesn't look like we have 
any new questions other than that one. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, the other way and talk about smaller stars. So uh, I'm gonna actually, you know, what I'm gonna do. Uh, the only thing is, it's gonna take up so much room. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna keep them layered. Unfortunately, I just don't want to give up that much real estate on the screen. I'm just gonna have to flick them like this. So let's talk about what happens when smaller stars die. Right. If you get a star between one and eight times the mass of the sun, so the sun's at the small end of this spectrum, actually, um, but one to eight solar masses, what you get is a different situation. The star isn't big enough to explode violently and give you a supernova. What happens instead is that core collapse thing happens, and you start to make things like carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, and this reaction sort of ebbs and flows inside the star. So it happens a little bit, but the star is not very massive to make it keep going. And so that reaction dies off, but then the core starts to collapse a little bit, then it flares up again, collapse and flare and collapse and flare. And while this is happening, the outer part of the star, the red giant part, is getting pushed and pushed and pushed, almost like it's just puffing and puffing and puffing. And eventually, the star does not die violently. It just blows away the outer layers. And what's left in the heart of the star is a little chunk of glowing carbon. A literal diamond in the sky. It's a chunk of glowing carbon. And that's it. That's all that's left. And you get this expanding spherical cloud of gas that's glowing because it's been ionized. Right? And it's still glowing. And this little chunk of glowing carbon in the middle we call a white dwarf. Now, this, uh, this type of object, this sort of spherical expanding nebula resulting from a smaller star, a medium size, something like the sun, is a type of object that we call a planetary nebula. Don't even get me started. I think it's the dumbest name ever because they have nothing to do with planets. But that's what they're called. And there are several examples. I'm zooming in right now on Gemini because somewhere in here... Really? We're just not going to show it on the screen? NGC 2371. There it is. Oh, I didn't know it was called the Ant Nebula. This is kind of what we get left over. Boy, these images in Stellarium are terrible. Let me find you a better one. Actually, you know what? I'm going to find you one of the most famous ones. Everybody likes this guy. We're going to pull up the Helix Nebula. And it's taking a second to load because it's a huge image. And I'm just going to check my Twitch chat real fast. Cool, cool. All right. Actually, so you did ask, does every death of a star become a black hole? No, but I will say the corollary is true. I mentioned iron earlier. It is true that the only source of iron is gigantic stars dying. So every piece of iron you've ever found or interacted with, whether it's in the form of a piece of steel or whatever, is like this exacto blade. This killed a star, right? Every bit of iron you've ever experienced murdered a star at one point in time. So, or, or probably several stars. I mean, this this iron probably didn't all come from one star. Um, but because that stuff was thrown back into the universe, uh, because that stuff gets thrown back in the universe, when new stars form and the planets form around them, they could be enriched by these elements. That's why we have iron, because previous stars died, right? Uh, but anyway, so this right here, oh, Roger has mentioned real fast. Roger, thank you for being a fact checker guy for me. I appreciate you. Uh, he has said that the, the density of a neutron star is 8.8 .8 billion times the density of lead. I, I can't even wrap my head around a number like that. What is what does 8.8 .8 billion times as dense even mean? That's incredible. So this right here, this is the Helix Nebula. So the Helix Nebula is an example of a planetary nebula. So when you see these, this is a star not unlike our sun that has died, right? This is what the sun will look like after it has died, or something like this. Um, and you'll see that there's a little dot in the middle. There, You can see that's, that's the white dwarf. That's the leftover chunk of glowing carbon about the size of the Earth. And it's just glowing because it's hot. It's no longer a living star. It's no longer undergoing fusion. 
It's just a glowing rock, basically. It's just so incredibly hot that it's going to sit there and keep glowing bright white for literally billions of years. It takes so long for these to cool off that none of them ever have in the age of the universe. And you see all around it, this is all the leftover material from the outer layers of that star, all shed and drifting out into space and glowing because they're ionized by the radiation from this central point. Uh, that's a planetary nebula. Um, they're really cool targets for telescopes, by the way. There's a lot of really cool planetary nebula. The one that I was showing you guys a second, I'll, I'll bring it up again. It's called the Ant Nebula. This guy right here. Now, this one's formed two lobes, so there must have been some asymmetry going on when this one formed to cause these two lobes. They don't always do that. Some of them do, though. Another good example, Ring Nebula. Kind of looks like the Helix Nebula, right? Looks like a big ring. So those are planetary nebulae. Um, they're very, they're they're pretty cool uh, objects as well. Oh, my cousin Morgan is here. What's up, Morgan? Welcome. Uh, hopefully, everybody out in Texas and Oklahoma is doing okay. Uh, and it's cool to see that you are here as well. Like I've been saying, uh, actually, now's a good time for me to just pause and remind everybody that um, this is a publicly, this is a public astronomy session this is open to everybody share this post it to your facebook wall i'm going to be here till 8 30 um everybody and their dog is invited and i let you guys drive the conversation somebody asked about neutron stars so we talked about the life and birth and death of stars and somebody asked if they all turn into black holes and so we talked about black holes and when they do and when they don't because uh, there is also the twitch chat i am still glancing at that occasionally uh, we talked about what would happen to our own sun one day when it dies. Uh, oh, and I'll quickly say, by the way, that we're about halfway through. Right? So the sun, based on its mass, it would have a life of about 10 billion years. We're at the 5 billion year mark now. Somewhere, we're around there, right? Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. The sun's a little older than that. Uh, so we're about halfway. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what's going to happen when the sun dies. It's going to become one of those planetary nebulae. Oh, right. So I was saying, I just want to remind everybody that this is open for the public. And yes, p please participate in the YouTube or Twitch chat because your questions, I should really turn off the volume on this thing. Your questions drive the discussion, right? I want this to be your show. We'll talk about whatever you find interesting. Mind you, you're welcome to sit and listen to me talk if you just find what I'm saying interesting, but don't be afraid to ask away. And the big thing, the big thing I always tell people is that a lot of people feel like, oh, I'm not going to ask. That's a dumb question. I don't want to look dumb. It's a dumb question whatever. Please ask the dumb questions. The dumb questions are often the best questions. And when we do these things in person, I find that children are the best. Children have no problem with that. They'll ask the stupidest questions that pop into their head. Dennis is here. Faith is here as well. Welcome, Faith. Glad to have you guys. Um, and children, yeah, children will just ask anything that pops in their head. They don't have this concept of like, oh, it's embarrassing to ask this dumb question because they're a child. Like people just expect them to ask stuff. And I find that some of the really coolest questions come from children, that they really ask stuff that's actually really interesting to talk about. So if you've got something that you're not sure about with astronomy that you that you don't understand or you just want to learn more about and you, you feel dumb, you don't want to ask a dumb question, by all means, ask it. Because I'm sure it will actually be something really cool that we'll, that we'll talk about. And it will help me fill the time until 8.30, right? <laughs> so, on that note, I am going to take a quick pause and give people a chance to ask questions while I try to think of something else I can talk about. Because we pretty much exhausted the topic, at least for now. Unless anybody had any questions, wanted me to go back and revisit anything I talked about. But for now, I think we just about exhausted the uh, topic of stellar evolution, the lifespan of a star from birth to death. And so while I try to think of more stuff to talk about, by all means, get in, the, get in the comments, get in the chat, and ask away. Ask away whatever questions you may have. And I'll give you guys a, a chance to do that. Um, while, you're, while you're thinking of things that you may be interested to talk about, I will also take this opportunity to remind everybody that I am the membership director 
for the Northeast Florida Astronomical Society. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, an educational organization. We do outreach events. Um, because of coronavirus, we had to cancel all of our in-person outreach, which inspired this. Um, now that vaccinations are coming out, I got my first one, second one's coming up. Um, but now that the vaccine is out and people are getting vaccinated against it, um, we're going to start doing more in-person stuff. But I am going to continue doing these because I think this is great. I love it. And so I'm going to do these. And actually, what I've been thinking of is... Oh, right. Somebody asked... I'm sorry, man. I, I, I didn't get your question. I'm glad you asked it again, Jane, because you're right. I, I breezed past that. Thank you so much for reminding me about the Lyrids. So... Um, I'm going to talk about, I will, I will talk about that here in a second. So, um, yeah, so what I was saying is we're a nonprofit organization. We're going to start doing these things in, in, uh, in person. And even when we do, I'm going to continue doing this online. One thing I'm thinking of, and you guys can let me know in the chat what you think about this. I'm thinking of doing these on the Thursdays closest to first quarter moon. Uh, the reason why it's based on the lunar phases is I want to make sure that it doesn't interfere with our observing when we have like nice, good observing nights. I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be out in the middle of nowhere with a telescope. Um, but I also don't want to conflict with our Hannah Park sessions when we start doing those again, because those are Saturdays closest to the first quarter moon. And I was thinking a lot of people probably going to want to start to get out and do fun things on Fridays and Saturdays, maybe Thursday. So that's my thought. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, I think I might schedule the next one for a Thursday, see how it goes. And so... Yeah, so Northeast Florida Astronomical Society, you can check us out. Uh, also worth mentioning real fast is the St. Augustine Club, Ancient City Astronomy Club. So if you live closer to the St. Augustine area, check them out. Now, I know we have at least one viewer here from Texas. Uh, so hopefully you've got viewers from all over the place. If you're not in the Jacksonville or St. Augustine area, um, then obviously you, know, you may not be part of these clubs, but you're always welcome to join us on Facebook anyway and be part of the conversation. Um, but wherever you live, I highly encourage getting involved with an astronomy club if you are interested in astronomy. It's the best way to go. Don't just get a telescope and go out by yourself. Astronomy is a team sport. I really do believe that. So let's talk Lyrid meteor showers. So, or, yep, or you can join both clubs like I did uh, and like this person in the chat did as well. Um, who is that, I wonder? It says... Uh, Florida Dance Gypsy. Not sure who that is that dances and is a gypsy, but they join both clubs, not join both clubs. Veronica. Oh, okay. Hey, Veronica. All right. So, yeah, that's that's also an option. But if you if you don't live in the Jacksonville or St. Augustine areas, get involved with whatever club. So so Jane asked and then so patiently waited and waited and then asked me again about the Lyrid meteor shower. I appreciate you sticking with me. So let's talk a little bit about that. First of all, I'm actually not sure when the Lyrids are going to peak, so let me pull that up. It's always worth admitting that I don't know everything myself, and I don't keep good track of the meteor showers. So this is actually a topic that I'm not 100% knowledgeable on, but we'll learn about it together. So let's see here. Oh, it's active now. Okay, cool. So the Lyra Meteor Shower is is ongoing right now. And let's see here. It says that they're about to peak on April 21st to 22nd. So that's pretty good. 10 to 15 meteors per hour. That's a decent amount. Um, although, that's sorry, that's the average. The Lyrids are going to get to 100 per hour. Nice. That's a decent shower. Yeah, it's a decent meteor shower. So let's talk about what, what the Lyrids are. So um, for one thing, when we name these meteor showers, we name them according to where they appear to come from. All right? And nice job. Thanks. I appreciate it. I, I like getting – I appreciate the feedback because it's – I don't, I can't hear you guys. You're not in the room with me. So sometimes it kind of feels like I'm talking to the void. So you guys being active in the chat makes me not feel alone when I'm doing this. It makes me feel like you guys are appreciating it. and You're getting something out of it. So I really appreciate you saying that. Uh, it makes it feel like this is worth doing. Uh, and you guys do make it feel worth doing. I really appreciate you guys coming out to these. So let me time travel a little bit. 
I'm going to have to go pretty early morning to bring it up. So this is the constellation Lyra, right? That's Lyra. Lyra is supposed to represent the harp of Orpheus from Greek mythology. And if you've ever heard of the star Vega, like if you've ever seen the movie Contact, that's, that's in Lyra. So when we name a meteor shower, it's named based on the constellation where it appears that the meteors are coming from. Uh, so to let you know what a meteor is, actually, I should probably back up and say what a meteor is. Basically, bits of rock, debris, dust, whatever, that come in through the atmosphere and they burn up on entry. And so you get this bright streak across the sky. That's a meteor, right? Um, there's three terms, there's three vocabulary words here. There is a meteoroid. A meteoroid is what it's called when this object is out in space. It is called a meteor when it streaks across the sky. So the atmospheric phenomenon of seeing that streak of light is called a meteor. If it makes it to the ground, mostly things actually get broken up. And to be fair, they don't go away completely. The conservation of mass means that if they are somewhere, they just tend to get vaporized and also turn into like sand, basically. But if it makes it to the ground, where you can actually pick up a chunk, that's a meteorite. So meteoroid in space, meteor in the sky, meteorite on the ground. Now, they appear to come from a constellation. And... That doesn't mean that you should just look directly at Lyra and you'll see them. What it means is that they're going to actually happen all over the sky. But when you see that streak, if you were to take that streak and trace it backwards, and you do that for all the meteors, that all those lines of where they appear like they're coming from would converge near the constellation Lyra. So we call them the Lyrid meteor shower. And actually Jane has very helpfully, I didn't even notice this at first, um, she put a lot of good information in the chat if you want to observe the Lyrids um, as to when and you know when we're going to have a moonless night and this kind of thing. So excellent information on that as well. Uh, the moon setting at 4 a.m., that, that's going to be rough to, to view the maximum of the Lyrids. The problem is that the moon itself makes the whole sky glow. And so it sets a sort of, sort of minimum level of brightness. And you'll only see meteors that are brighter than that, that are brighter than that sky glow. Now, meteors, thankfully, are a fairly bright phenomenon, but not terribly bright, because if you've ever like looked at the sky in the city, you probably don't see them that often. But if you get out somewhere dark, you see them all the time. The average, like I was just reading, is 10 to 15 an hour. You ask any of us in our club, there's not a night that goes by if we go out observing that we don't see like a handful of meteors at least. Right? We see them all the time. Um, it's just that the city lights and things prevent us from really seeing them. And so the moon can have that effect as well. So if you go to observe a meteor shower during a, a moon, when you have a full moon or a quarter moon or whatever, that can impact which ones you can see. And you'll tend to only see the brighter ones. The other thing is where there's what are called sporadic meteors. Those are the 10 to 15 an hour. Even during a meteor shower, you'll see those. And so you'll start to learn if you've ever done meteor shower observing before, or you go out with anyone that knows what they're doing, You'll see, like, I'll zoom out here and show the whole sky. So you'll see a meteor will go, like, pew, and it'll shoot this way, over this way, or it'll go that way. But basically, they'll all look like they're heading away from Lyra. And then you'll see when it comes in like this, right? It's coming in the complete wrong direction. It looks like it's heading towards Lyra or across it, or it's shooting in from here. Those meteors are not a part of that meteor shower. They're just part of that random background noise of meteors that we always have. And those, those can be fun to like look for. So one thing to look for when you're, um, oh yeah, I'll get to that. So one thing to look for when you're, when you're out, uh, observing a meteor shower is note which ones are true members of that shower because they're heading the correct direction. And then see if you can spot a sporadic meteor, right? That's kind of a neat little bonus thing to look for when you're out there looking, you see, Oh, Oh, you see them going, when you're, Oh, that one was a sporadic meteor. That's not part of the shower. It was going the wrong way. It's kind of cool to spot those. Uh, when we go out and observe, we often can tell, even if we're not tracking it, we can often tell like, oh, there's a meteor shower coming up because we'll see them more, right? And as uh, Astro Surf Wheel pointed out, and I'm not sure, there's a couple of people who you, you tend to use like surf names and comment on these things. So that's either Richard or that's, um, or that's Chris. I'm going to guess Chris um, has pointed out when we were at the swamp 
recently. That's what we call our dark sky observing location out in the Osceola State Forest. We call it the swamp. Um, we saw a bright, bright fireball. We actually saw a couple of fireballs, um, but one in particular just lit up the whole sky. It was literally like what it's like when lightning strikes and the whole sky lights up. That's what it was. It was just super, super bright. And one of our club members went, there's a website where people report when they see fireballs. You can actually go and say, like, I saw it. It looked like it was going this way, whatever. And there were other reports of it. We were able to identify what that was. Somebody actually found it. It was, um, oh, the, oh, your little picture of Jupiter. I should have realized it was Richard. Yep. Yep. Richard takes amazing f images of the planets. Honestly, just really cool stuff. And Jupiter is one of his one of his favorite subjects, so I should have known. But yeah, I think it turned out that it was a piece of an asteroid that had broken off. And the asteroid, I guess, passed close to Earth or whatever, and this piece of this asteroid was the, what this meteor was. Really cool. And we saw that while we were out there. It was, it was incredible. And you want to talk about a bunch of grown men out there getting real technical, like, oh, I'm looking for, you know, NGC 23, and then suddenly you hear, oh, and like everyone forgets what they're doing. And becomes a nine-year-old child again. With the whole sky illuminates, and you just there's something in you. You just have to ooh and ah like you're watching fireworks. You can't help it. And yeah, that that's that. Those moments are are fantastic. So that's a little bit about the Lyrid meteor shower. Oh, I should talk about what a meteor shower is, right? Because again, this is an educational program, and so I want you guys to learn something. Uh, so what a meteor shower actually is. Um, the reason why we know when they're going to happen and we can predict when they're going to happen and where they're going to appear to come from and this kind of thing is because what we're actually doing is we're passing through a cloud of dust and ice left behind by a passing comet. So this actually is a nice little segue to talk about what a comet is. I like comets for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, Comets are like these really transitory events. So every time you observe one, it feels special, right? That comet's not going to come back for 76 years or 2,000 years or whatever. So it's always cool to observe comets when you can. They're just neat. Um, we say that comets are like cats because they have tails and they do precisely what they want to do. Comets are notoriously difficult to predict their behavior. You think it's going to be bright. It's not. You think it's not going to be bright. And then you get comet neo eyes and it lights up and it's beautiful, right? Well, what a comet is, the other reason why I love comets is because everyone knows what a comet is right up until you ask them. And then a lot of people, suddenly they don't know what a comet is, right? So a really good example is I was doing a, a presentation one time at the Mosh, I think it was. And no, no, this was at, this was at Hannah Park. And I was talking about comets because there was a comet we could observe. And so I was talking about comets. And I said, you know, do you guys know what a comet is or whatever? Or no, this little girl was like, what's a comet? And her brother was like, you don't know what a comet is or uh, whatever. And I was like, oh, cool. What's a comet? And he was like, it's, um, and I was like, right. Okay. <laughs> right. Cause he, he was giving her a hard time. Cause like, everyone knows what a comet is. And then I asked him and then he couldn't remember. Right. What it really is, is it's a chunk of ice and rock. Right. It's, it's a big, dirty snowball out in space. And what happens is that these big chunks of ice and dirt and rock and whatever. Um, they have these really strange orbits. They don't orbit nice and neat around the sun like the planets do. They have these orbits that take them really close to the sun and then they shoot way out, way out past Neptune and all that. And then they take a really long time out there and then they come in and they whip around the sun and they shoot back out again. All right. They have what we call an eccentric orbit, a highly elongated orbit. Now, when they get close to the sun, the sun's heat will heat them up because they are just made of ice and they'll actually do something called sublimation. This is where they, they skip the liquid phase. They don't melt and then vaporize. They go straight to vaporization. And you've actually seen this. If you've ever watched dry ice, dry ice does this. It doesn't melt. It just goes straight to being steam. All right. Got a little mustache hair there tickling me. So they go straight to being steam. And this is what's happening with the comet. And then all the radiation pressure from the sun, all the particles and things the sun is throwing off, all this solar wind, as we call it, pushes that steam away from the comet to form a tail. So if you look in this picture, you're seeing this tail of steam right here, this whitish looking one. 
But what's also happening is that there's other stuff embedded in the comet as well, like nitrogen gas and these kinds of things. And it gets ionized, and then it's going to follow the magnetic field lines. And so this blue tail that you're seeing here is the ion tail. It's a lot harder to see the ion tail than the uh, water vapor tail on a comet. And some comets will get even more tails than that, actually. But that's what you're seeing. And what's interesting is that it's almost the exact opposite of what you might imagine, right? People probably imagine that a comet's like a fireball streaking through the sky. But actually, it's steaming ice, right? And not only that, but we tend to imagine that the comet is heading a certain direction because intuitively, you know, you, you probably, like, you throw a toilet paper roll, right? Or you throw something that's got, like, a loose dangly bit, and it's going to trail behind it, right? This is what we imagine. We, we picture this is probably a fireball going and the tail's trailing behind it, but that's not actually true. Um, that tail is being pushed away by the sun, which means that a comet's tail is not necessarily behind the comet. It's always going to be pointed away from the sun. So while the comet is heading towards the sun, yes, the tail is behind it. But once it comes around and starts heading back out into the outer solar system, that tail is actually in front of the comet. So if you imagine my finger is the comet, and it comes in and it goes around the sun like this, and then it's following its own tail out into the outer solar system. But all that steam coming off, basically the comet loses material every time it passes by the sun. And so in the orbit of the comet, we get like all these little bits of rocks and dirt and ice crystals and stuff left in the wake of this comet. And when we pass through that, all that stuff is skipping off the atmosphere and that causes the effect of a meteor shower. That's what we see as a meteor shower. Um, and that's why we are able to predict them. We know if it's going to be a particularly good meteor shower because of what the comet did, right? The, did the comet make a nice, big, impressive tail and do a bunch of stuff? We're probably going to have a good shower, right? Probably a lot of material left over. Um, and so that's that's what that's what meteor showers are as we're passing through the comet tails. Uh, in fact, we can find out which one is associated with the Lyrid meteor shower. Let's see here. Uh, the comet for the Lyrids is comet C1861G1 Thatcher. Comets don't always have cool names. I'm going to be honest with you about that. But uh, let's see if anyone got a picture of it. Oh, you know what? Okay, so the name of a comet is the year of its discovery. This thing was discovered back in 1861. This is, a, this is an image somebody made. This is an artist's impression. I don't think there's any photographs of this comet because of how long ago it was. But this was somebody... Sketch, look at all these tails. Man, that must have been an impressive comet to see. Really cool. Um, but yeah, they get named after um, the person who discovered it. Uh, do, do, do. And the year. And then, and then they get a letter designation. So the letter C are short period comets. So their comets whose period is less than, I think, 200 years. So they're still pretty long. Sometimes it's going to be a while before they come around. Um, and then, no, sorry, all the way around. The ones that have a P, they're, they're called something P, those are short period comets. C are long period. So this comet, let's see, it's, it's got a period. How long does it take? When's the next time it's going to be back? Next pair of helium in 2265. So if any of you guys are still around in 2265, um, you can watch this comet come back. Otherwise, you'll never see it. Uh, yeah, so, and then uh, Thatcher, that must have been the guy who first discovered it, I guess, because they named it after him, right? The, that's how comets get named. So this is a long period comet, and it causes the Lyrid meteor shower. So that's kind of cool. Uh, there we go. So yeah, good question there about the Lyrid meteor shower. Um, while we're in Lyra, I want to point something out real fast. We actually talked about it already. If we look at these two stars here, Sheliak and Sulafot. Sheliak. Oh, hey, that was an episode of Star Trek. Anyway, if we zoom in between the two, 
we get this one right here, the Ring Nebula. Man, that's a terrible picture. I showed you guys a picture of it earlier. Remember, it kind of looked like the Helix Nebula, but not quite. It was blue in the middle. Oh, you know what? I'll show it to you again. Why not? That one looks, it looks really cool through a telescope because it looks like a smoke ring through a telescope. Uh, you can't usually see color in a telescope of some of these distant objects, these deep sky objects. But what this, this part that's like lit up orange here through a telescope looks like a gray ring. And then it looks like the, it, the middle part looks hollow in a telescope. So that's the ring nebula. That's what's, that's what's over there. And since we're here, let's talk a little bit about something called the Summer Triangle. All right, so the Summer Triangle is these three bright stars, Deneb, Vega, and Altair. And they identify the constellations Cygnus, Lyra, and Aquila. And you see it lies basically along the Milky Way. You'll notice that the Milky Way is a little bit brighter here. This is called the Cygnus Star Cloud. It's just a particularly bright patch of Milky Way. And actually what's happening there is not that there's more stars. It's that there's less gas between us and the stars. We can see them more clearly. Uh, so it appears that there's more. It's like, an op it's like a hole in the interstellar medium that lets us see more. And that's what we call the Cygnus Star Cloud. Uh, hmm. What else can I talk about? We've got about... 20 minutes left maybe 19 minutes left in this presentation and you guys have been hanging out and you've been so cool this whole time uh really appreciate you guys taking part um i'm gonna give you guys a chance to ask any other questions any any other topics that you guys want to talk about before we start to wrap this thing up because I forgot to eat dinner and I am starving. <laughs> but I will happily talk about maybe one more interesting topic um, before we wrap this thing up. And then I'm going to go get something to eat. I don't know, I'm gonna, I don't know what I'm going to eat, but I'm going to go get something. What are you guys thinking? What do you guys want to talk about? Oh, actually, um, you know what? Somebody did mention this earlier. Uh, so I'll go ahead and talk about this while you guys think of any, any kind of topics. Uh, somebody mentioned the two in the view. So uh, there's this thing called the Astronomical League. I'm going to go ahead and bring up some information on them. Uh, I've been talking a lot about the astronomy clubs, and of course I will again before we close out the uh, thing as well. But basically all the astronomy clubs in the United States... Uh, maybe even in other countries, I'm not sure. I think this is a United States kind of thing. Are members of uh, basically a parent organization called the Astronomical League. They've been going for 50 years. Um, it's a really cool organization. If you're a member of NEFIS or if you're a member of uh, the Ancient City Astronomy Club or, again, if you live in Texas, I'm sure there's members member clubs in Texas as well, uh, then being a member of that club makes you a member of the Astronomical League as well. The Astronomical League does a lot of cool stuff. Uh, one of the things they do is these observing programs. And so you can get certifications, you can get certificates and pins um, for achieving certain goals. And in fact, I have a few of them. If you guys really are curious, I'll tell you which ones I've got. Um, I've got this one, Binocular Messier. And this is the, where's the regular Messier? Do, do, do. Messier. So I actually have this pin on a hat. Um, this is for observing all one all 110 objects on the Messier list, which we can get into that a little bit, what that is. Um, and then there's the binocular one, uh, because I observed 50 of them through binoculars. Um, one of these that I'm really proud of, um, because not a lot of people have it, is this one right here, the Sketching Award. I actually sketch everything I observe. I take out a pad... Uh, a, a, sheet of paper and a pencil and a little blending stumps to blur in the nebulae and things. And I wear like a headlamp 
that's dull red light and I look through the eyepiece and I make sketches. Uh, so for this, I actually got a certificate for sketching a number of objects on a particular list and qualifying for it. Uh, they number the certificates. So when you get a certificate, you're number whatever. Uh, my Messier certificate, I'm number 2,000 something. But for my sketching, I'm literally number 39. <laughs> I'm the 39th person to do this. So really proud of that one. But but Richard mentioned there's one called Two in the View that I've been working on. Um, and this one's really cool. You can see two objects at once. So these are all different places in the in the sky where you can observe multiple things together within the same view. And that's called Two in the View. So uh, Richard mentioned that. So uh, there we go, Richard. Now we talked a little bit about the Two in the View. But this is a really good topic to bring up just because if you are new to the astronomy hobby, I highly encourage you to join a club, of course. And I highly encourage you to look into these observing programs because, you know, early on, everything's new. And you're like, oh, I'm looking at the Orion Nebula, I'm looking at the Andromeda Galaxy, whatever. And then very quickly, you'll find that there's like a handful of objects you really like. And every time you go observe, you'll look at those same objects. And there's nothing wrong with looking at those same objects. But when you have these programs to go after, it gives you goals. And these goals are a great way to improve your skills as an astronomer and to really get in the hobby. Because um, you'll notice, I, I, as we're sitting here talking, I know all these constellations. And those of you who have had the opportunity to actually go out somewhere dark with me, you know, out in the middle of nowhere without a chart, I could point out all the, a lot of these con constellations and find my way around the sky. Well, the reason I can do that is because I did the Astronomical League's uh, Messier program. And by doing that program, by having to find 110 different things, I had to use constellations to find them. And so I learned the sky by doing, right? And there is a program called Constellation Hunter. If you just want to learn constellations, there's a program for that. Um, but it's really cool. It gives you a goal, and then you can and then you can get these certificates and these pins. And it's like these like it's almost like Xbox achievements. Achievement unlocked. You've you've seen all 110 Messier objects. Achievement unlocked. You saw all these objects from the two in the view list. Or the the one I'm working on right now, um, while I'm doing two in the view, is another one I'm working on. It's called the Herschel 400. It's 400 things I got to observe. Holy cow! I'm sketching every last one of them too. I'm a complete moron. I'm a lunatic, man. I can't believe I'm doing it. But I'm doing it <laughs> because um, I find this stuff fascinating and I'm, and I'm finding objects I never would have known to look at because it's what I'm going to do. Dig through the catalog of the NGC. There's thousands of them, right? Um, but I'm going through this program. That Ant Nebula, I had no idea about it, man. But I, uh, I was one of the ones on the list. It was one of the ones I had to see. And it was really cool. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. So uh, somebody asked, what's a, a good, easy program to start with? I'm going to bring up my thing, actually, because there's a couple of suggestions I have. So, um, actually, Solar System Project is not as easy as it sounds. There's some really intense requirements on that project, but um, some really good ones. Um, so, if you're new and you want to know what are some good ones to do, um, for one, if, if you have kids, there's one called the Sky Puppy Program. All right, The Sky Puppy Program is a program specifically to get children into astronomy. There are 62 activities. They're not all observing things. Some of them are things like making a model of a, of a lunar crater or the, these fun activities for kids to do, draw draw 15 constellations. And this one's cool because it's a little sampler of just about everything. So if you've got kids that are interested in astronomy, this is a really fun program to go through for kids. And then there were a couple of people that said, man, the Sky Puppy program is cool. But it's, it's for kids, right? Wouldn't it be cool if there was something for adults, but it was a crash course, right? For grown adults to get into astronomy. And so they made the Beyond Polaris program. So Beyond Polaris, it's 30 activities. And this, again, it covers all kinds of bases. You're going to be observing, but you're also going to be learning Star party etiquette. What kind of things should you bring if you're going to a star party, which is what we call it when a bunch of nerds get together in the middle of the woods to look at stuff, right? You're going to learn is you're going to learn some mythology and all kinds of stuff going through this. Uh, if you're a bit more interested in like, no, but I just want to get out and look at stuff. Uh, a really good place to start 
it, especially if you're interested in what we call deep sky astronomy, you want to look at galaxies, nebulae, star clusters, these kinds of things. Um, the Messier program is a great starting point. Uh, Charles Messier did all of his observations with a telescope that by today's standards would be garbage from 1800s or 1700s Paris, France. Um, so all of his objects are the biggest, brightest, best, most beautiful, many of the biggest, brightest, best, most beautiful deep sky objects. That Ring Nebula I mentioned, the Helix Nebula, Orion Nebula, Andromeda Galaxy, Whirlpool Galaxy, um, the Pleiades, those are all on the Messier list, right? And the Messier program, it's 110 objects. You actually will get a certificate after 70, and then you can go for the whole 110. It's another great place I recommend if you're if you're new and you want to get started. Uh, if you're just looking to do naked eye observing and you just want to learn the constellations, uh, there's a Constellation Hunter program. Right? And they got a separate one for the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. So if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, you're going to go after the Northern Hemisphere ones. And you're going to sketch and talk about the constellations. So that's another great way to start. So... Yeah, that's a good place to end, actually. So if you're a member of one of these clubs or you're thinking about being a member, membership also includes membership in the Astronomical League. Uh, you can also be a member of the Astronomical League at large, that you can just buy a membership directly from them. And whether or not you're a league member, I mean, you can use these lists as inspiration, but I think the coolest part is getting credit for your work. I think get, getting those pins and those certificates is really cool. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and um, start doing my closing at this point, I guess. Uh, but that was a great question about um, what are some of the, the good programs to start with. Uh, Jane is mentioning something, so we're going to talk about that real fast. Uh, SpaceX Falcon 9 occurs on the same morning as the Lyrid Maximum. Yeah, so that hmm, that's interesting that they're going to do that the same morning. It's at 4, 4 oh, is it 6 a.m.? 6 a.m., so by that point, it'll be daytime, but... Hopefully clear skies. Um, but yeah, Lyrid uh, meteor shower happening at uh, 6 a.m. on that same morning. Or are they um, SpaceX happening at the same time at the Lyrids, the same morning as the peak? Uh, so I'm going to quickly say, and I've already kind of talked about it a little bit when I was talking about the clubs, but um, about the observing programs. Is I want to remind you guys one more time before we close this thing out. Uh, yes, I am shamelessly promoting the club repeatedly. It's my job. I'm the membership director. Um, if you have any questions at all, and it doesn't just have to be about membership. If you just, if something occurs to you or you want to pick my brain about what's a good telescope to buy, I love getting emails. I, I don't get nearly enough email. And, and if you guys email membership at nephis.org, that's my email address. You can ask me whatever. Uh, if you are interested in membership, of course. You can always go to our website, nephis.org, find the membership tab. And actually, while we're here, Nephis BOD is the board of directors for our club. And there I am. And that link is my email. But if you go here to join Nephis, you can just fill this out. These are our membership levels. Uh, Benefactor and corporate are literally just if you want to give us more money. These are just people who want to support the, the club by paying more. There's actually no additional benefit. Sometimes if we like, if we're raffling something off, our benefactors will get two tickets instead of one. But for the most part, it's just you're showing extra support. The main options I want to draw people's attention to are the individual choice is 40. These are yearly, by the way. This is the whole year membership. $40 for a year for an individual. Students and seniors are just $20. So if you got a student ID or you're over 55, 20 bucks for the whole year. Uh, and then a family, which we don't get super nitpicky about what we call a family, is any two adults and however many kids they're in charge of, you're a family, right? Uh, we've had couples that actually just said, can we just do a family? Yeah, fine. That's fine. You're a family, right? You're, we think you're family, right? And then we got benefactor and corporate if um, you're just feeling particularly generous. And then uh, this will take you to PayPal. So you can just pay right there in PayPal. Um, one of the cool benefits of, of club membership, I'm going to talk about real fast. Our club is currently in the possession of four of these. 
Orion SkyQuest 6-inch telescopes. If you're a member of Nephis, you can check it out like a library book for a month and bring it back. It's literally yours to use for a month. We'll show you how to use it. We'll collimate it so it's good to go. Show you, explain about the eyepieces, and you can take it for a month. It's part of being a member. Um, but yeah, and then if you live in the St. Augustine area, our sort of our sister club is the Ancient City Astronomy Club. Um, they're another great group of guys. Uh, I don't know 100% about the benefits of their membership and what they've got going on. Not that that telescope is the only benefit of being a Nephis. It's just something I wanted to point out. But um, the St. Augustine Club, also fantastic. Um, so if you're in that area, check them out as well. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Um, and I just want to encourage everybody in the last five minutes, I just want to quickly encourage you guys to get outside, look up, look at these things for yourself, learn about them. Our universe is so vast and so beautiful and it's free of charge. It really is. I know I was just talking about club membership dues, but if you get out somewhere dark you can just look. And the thing I tell everybody is that's your sky. That sky belongs to you, right? That's that's the sky of the earth. That's the space as viewed from the earth. Everyone born, born on earth, that's your birthright, that sky. And all the light pollution that's going on, all these bright lights we have in the city, it's ruining your sky. So I would encourage you, if you have outdoor lights, put shielding on them. Turn that light down. Do your part. And then get out somewhere dark, man. Get out somewhere because you owe it to yourself to see a truly dark sky and connect with the universe out there. And that's what I, that's what I want to leave you guys with. I want you guys to get out and, and enjoy the universe. Look at these things. And then if you find that you're passionate about this and you want to learn more about astronomy, check out my things every month. I'm going to be doing these every month. Uh, check out these clubs. And when we start doing our, our in-person stuff, or again, if you're not here in Florida, if you're in Texas or wherever you are, Find out if there's local clubs that do outreach because most astronomy clubs, they'll do things that they set up and you can look through their telescopes. You don't have to own one yourself. We do it all the time. And I would encourage you to get out and start exploring this universe because it's a beautiful place. And that's it. I just uh, wanted to end on that. So thank you guys so much for coming. We got like three minutes left, but I think that's about it. So thank you and have a wonderful evening. Beautiful place. And that's it. I just uh, wanted to end on that. So thank you guys so much for coming. We got like three minutes left, but I think that's about it. So thank you and have a wonderful evening. Full place.